Chapter 54. The Winter. The island was quiet. The migratory birds had all left, the hibernators were asleep, and everyone else had begun their simple winter routines. Everyone but Roz. Now that she was alone, our robot didn't know what to do with herself. She stood in her gray garden and watched a sheet of ice slowly form on the pond. Sometimes she could hear her good friends, the beavers, going about their business beneath the ice, and she wondered when she would see them again. Roz stood there until snowflakes started drifting down from the sky. The flakes swirled in the breeze and slowly piled up on the ground and on the trees and on the robot. So she crouched into the nest, slid the stone door behind her, and sat in darkness. Hours and days and weeks went by without the robot moving. She had no need to move. She felt perfectly safe in the nest. And so, in her own way, the robot hibernated. Roz's, Roz's body relaxed. Her quiet whirring slowly stopped. Her eyes faded to black. She probably could have spent centuries like that, hibernating in total darkness. But the robot's hibernation was suddenly interrupted when a shaft of sunlight fell upon her face and carried energy back to her empty battery. Roz's body tensed. Her quiet whirring, whirring slowly started. Her eyes began to glow. Hello, I am Rosam Unit 7134, but you may call me Roz, the robot said automatically. When all her systems were up and running again, Roz noticed that she was surrounded by broken branches and piles of snow. The roof of the nest had caved in, and the lodge was now flooded with sunlight. Roz felt more energized with each passing minute, but she also felt cold. Her joints felt stiff and brittle, and her thinking was slow. So she got up cleared a spot on the floor, and made a fire. The snow inside the nest began to melt, and the robot's sensors began to thaw, and when she was ready, she climbed out through the hole in the roof and into a bright, foreign landscape. The world Ross had known was now covered in a thick layer of snow. Tree limbs bent to the ground under heavy sleeves. The dark pond was now pure white, the only sounds were Roz's own crunching footsteps. Faint wisps of steam curled up from the robot's body as she trudged through the forest. Raj plunged into a hand into a lump of snow and pulled up a long stick. She snapped it in half and flung both pieces back to the nest. She took a few more steps and picked up a fallen tree. She hacked it into smaller pieces and flung them back as well. Then she reached down to another snowy shape. But what she pulled up was not a piece of wood. It was Dart the Weasel. He was frozen solid. Roz stared at his stiff body for a moment, then decided it was best to leave the poor thing where he was. As the robot continued gathering wood, she found more victims of the cold. A frozen mouse. A frozen bird. A frozen deer. Had all the, islands frozen, had all the island animals frozen to death? No, not all. There were a few fresh tracks in the snow. As we know, the wilderness is filled with beauty, but it's also filled with ugliness. And that winter was ugly. A devastating cold front had swept down from the north and brought dangerous temperatures and huge amounts of snow. The animals had prepared for winter, but nothing could have prepared the weaker ones for those long nights when the temperature plummeted and the wind whipped over the island. Roz returned to the nest, where the fire had melted the interior snow to a muddy soup. She took a minute to warm her body by the flames, and then she began the repairs. She patched up the hole in the dome with a latticework of branches before adding a layer of mud and leaves, and soon the repairs were complete. But another snowfly might cave in the nest all over again, so Roz decided to keep a fire going day and night to prevent snow from building up on the roof. The robot brought in load after load of firewood, and each time she went outside, she was reminded of the frozen weasel and mouse and bird and deer. How many other frozen animals were hidden beneath the snow? Before going in for the night, she called out to whoever was listening, listening, Animals of the island, you do not have to freeze. Join me in my lodge where it is safe and warm. Chapter 55 the lodgers. Firelight spilled out from the nest and listened to the wind and the soft pop. Take two. 
fire light spilled out from the nest and into the cold, blustery night. Ra sat inside and listened to the wind and the soft pops and crackles of burning wood. And then the robot's keen hearing picked up another sound, tiny footsteps crunching through the snow. Ross, I'm freezing. Can I join you by the fire, please? Said a weak voice. Into the light crawled Chit Chat. The squirrel was shivering and clumps of ice struck to, stuck to her fur. When she finally felt the heat of the fire, she collapsed. Ross picked her, off, picked her up off the floor, gently placed her on a warm stone, and let her sleep. An hour later, there were more footsteps, and a family of hares shuffled into the nest. They huddled together in a corner without saying a word. Pinktail, the possum, was next to arrive. Good evening, she mumbled, trying to act cheerfully. It certainly has been ch 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 chilly. Swooper the owl hobbled in, followed by some chickadees and a magpie. Fink knew a good thing when he saw it, and the fox lay down right by the fire. Then came Dig Down, the groundhog. The fuzzy bandits carried in an old turtle named Crag, who was in the worst shape of all. Creatures who should have been hibernating deep underground had been roused by that vicious weather. Only the healthiest animals with the warmest homes were safe. More and more weary animals appeared, and slowly the lodge filled up. This was the first time many of the lodgers had seen fire, and they gazed at it with a mixture of fear and hope. They could feel the fire's destructive power, but they could also feel its healing power as it warmed their bones. The lodgers seemed to push forward, eager to feel more warmth, and then pull back, afraid of feeling too much. It was important that the lodgers understood fire, so Roz showed them how to build one. She showed the smaller animals how to arrange the kindling, and she showed the bigger animals how to arrange the logs. Bumpkin, Lumpkin, and Rumpkin struck the firestones together, and everyone cheered when they finally managed a spark. As Roz looked around, she saw moles curling up beside an owl, a mouse snuggling between two weasels, hares nestling against a badger, Never before had the robot seen prey and predators so close and peaceful. But how long could the peace possibly last? I propose a truce, said Roz, like the dawn truce. Everyone must agree not to hunt or harm one another while in my lodge. Very well, said Swooper, after consulting his carn carn carnivorous friends. We're, we hunters will control ourselves. Then it is settled, said Roz. My home is a safe place for all. One by one, the lodgers each fell into a deep sleep. Even the nocturnal creatures, usually wide awake at that hour, gave in to the coziness of the nest. The robot stood out of the way and quietly tended to the fire as her guests slept through the night. Only when daylight was streaming in through the door did the lodgers finally begin to stir. You are all welcome to stay here as long as you like, said the robot as the animals rubbed sleep from their eyes. My home is your home. Thanks a lot, Roz. Fink carefully stepped over a hare and a woodpecker on his way to the door. I don't think I would have survived another night on my own. It's just too bad we can't cram a few more creatures in here. And the fox slipped outside. The robot looked down at the fur and feathers that now carpeted the floor. The nest had been completely full that night. If any more animals showed up, they'd been left out in the cold. But Roz was not about to let that happen. Kind of reminds me of the mitten, huh? Chapter 56, The New Lodges The second lodge would have been bigger than the first if it was going to fit Broadfoot, the bull moose. He was a towering hulk of an animal and had a thick coat of fur, but even he was struggling with the frigid temperatures. Broadfoot lived on the other side of the pond, in a dense section of forest that was home to many animals, most of whom were in a desperate need of a good thaw. The winter days were short, so there was no time to waste, and rather than walking all the way around the pond, Roz tested its frozen surface to see if it was safe to cross. She threw a heavy rock high in the air and watched it bounce off the hard ice. Then she carefully walked over the ice and into the forest on the other side, where she found Broadfoot waiting for her. 
The moose quietly led the robot to the clearing in the trees where the new lodge would go. Then Roz made a fire and watched as cold creatures began crawling out from the shadows. Do not worry, the robot said to the growing crowd, steam puffing up from their noses. You will all be warm soon, but I need your help. Roz asked the animals to collect anything useful they could find. Large stones, strong branches, chunks of frozen mud. With the robot's building expertise and the small army of helpers, construction of the second lodge didn't take long. The animals happily agreed to the robot's truce, and then they shuffled into the warm wooden dome. If you keep the fire alive, it will keep you alive, exclaimed Roz as she dropped another log onto the flames. But be careful. Fire can turn deadly in an instant. At dawn, heavy snow was falling again, and there was Roz, setting out from the nest to build a third lodge. She trudged into the great meadow, where fierce winds had created enormous, sweeping snowdrifts. But she powered through and finished the job, and was soon begin, beginning work on the fourth lodge. And then a fifth. The island became dotted with lodges that all glowed warmly through, long, through those long winter nights. And inside each one, Animals laughed and shared stories and cheered their good friend, Roz. Chapter 57 The Fire Strange sounds were echoing from the far side of the pond. What started as a low murmur gradually swelled to a chorus of terrified voices. There was an eerie glow in that part of the forest, and a thick plume of smoke became rising up from the snowy treetops. Roz charged across the ice, and found the second lodge completely engulfed by a raging fire. Frightened animals were running in every direction, fleeing for their lives through, through the deep snow. What happened? shouted Roz as Broadfoot galloped wildly past. We put too many logs in the fire pit, he said without stopping. The flames climbed up to the ceiling. My baby is still in there, cried a mother hare, pointing at the burning lodge. Somebody help, please. Roz didn't hesitate. She plowed through the snow and ducked into the lodge. Flames and smoke were everywhere. A tall stack of logs blazed in the fire pit. And in the far corner, a tiny ball of fur was shaking with fear. Crouching low, the robot wound her way beneath the smoke and around the flames and gently scooped up the young hare. Do not worry, Roz yelled over the fire, the roar of the fire. You are going to be okay. She turned to leave, but the doorway had started to crumble. So she shielded the hair with her body and smashed right through the walls of the lodge. Sizzling pieces of wood went flying as the robot and the hair burst outside into the soft snow. Oh, darling, you're all right, cried the mother hare, pulling her daughter close. Thank you for saving my baby, Roz. Now that everyone was safely away, the robot turned her attention to putting out the fire. Her glowing eyes darted around as she computed a plan. Then, with all the strength in her legs, Roz launched herself high up into the snowy branches of the nearest pine tree. A moment later, the tree was shaking viol violently, and heaps of snow were sliding from its branches and pouring onto the flames like an avalanche. Steam hissed up through the smothering mounds of snow. The flames quickly died, the snow quickly melted, and within minutes all that remained was the charred foundation from the, of the lodge. Roz dropped down from the tree and waited as the frightened animals slowly returned. Then she said to them, Would you like another lodge? The animals looked at one another, unsure of what to do. Understandably, they were afraid of another fire breaking out, but they were far more afraid of the deadly cold. So they pulled together and worked with Roz and built a bigger, better lodge on top of the old one. It had a taller ceiling and a deeper fire pit, and it was made with more rock and less wood, and it had a supply of water for emergencies. But the most important safety features of this rebuilt lodge were the lodgers themselves, who now had a whole new respect for fire. Chapter 58, The Conversations. Thanks to Roz's truce, Life inside the nest was mostly harmonious. And so they all get together. They all get along. But when the animals went outside, it was business as usual. Sometimes a lodger wouldn't return. 
Sometimes a lodger would return in the belly of another lodger. As you can imagine, that made for some awkward moments. So when everyone was gathered around the fire, they tried to keep things pleasant by having conversations like these. I wonder what Brightwell is doing now. Chit Chat lay on her back and looked at the ceiling as she spoke. And where he is and who he is and if he ever thinks about us back here on the island. I am sure he thinks about us, said Roz. I think about him all the time. I'd like to imagine that the geese had a fun flight to the wintering grounds and now Brightville is floating on a lovely lake eating yummy food and making wonderful new friends, but hopefully they're not too wonderful because I'd like to stay his best friend if possible. That is a nice thought, said Roz, but I worry that the flock might have gotten caught in this icy weather. I do not think they would handle it well. Don't worry, I'm sure they're fine, said Chit Chat. Brightville is such a great flyer that I just know he'll keep the flock out of great trouble. He is a great flyer, said Roz, but I still worry. Life is short, dig down, the old groundhog was giving another of her fireside speeches. I'll be lucky if I see the spring. I don't want your pity. I've had a good run, but I'll tell you what. If I could do it all over again, I'd spend more time helping others. All I've ever done is dig tunnels. Some of them were real beauties, too but they're all hidden underground, where they're no good to anyone but me. And they weren't even good to me this winter. Now the beavers, they have it all figured out. They built this that beautiful dam, which, was cre which created a lovely pond that made all our lives better. That must feel mighty good. The beavers made our lives better in another way, said Fink. They taught Ross how to build. Ain't that the truth, said Dig Down. Roz, you must have saved half the island with your lodges, and to think we used to call you a monster. I'll repay my debt to you if it's the last thing I do. Your friendship is payment enough, said Roz. Oh, please, your sweetness is going to make me sick. There must be something we can do. Your friendship is really enough. Friends help each other. All I need, and I will need all the help I can get. My mind is strong, but my body will not last forever. I want to survive as long as possible, and to do that, I will need the help of my friends. The animals listened quietly to Roz and the thought of their own struggles to survive. Life in the wilderness was hard for everyone. There was no escaping that fact. But the robot had made their lives a little easier, and if ever they could, the animals would return the favor. I have seen ninety-three winters, far more than any of you. Crag, the turtle, spoke slowly, but everyone always listened to his words. And I can tell you that the winters have gotten colder, and the summers have gotten hotter, and the storms have gotten fiercer. I have heard that the ocean has gotten higher, said Chit Chat, but I wouldn't see how that could be true. I mean, where would all the extra water come from? You are right, the ocean is higher, said Crag. My grandfather used to say that, long ago, this island was not an island at all. It was a mountain surrounded by flatlands. And then the ground shook, and the oceans grew, and the land slowly flooded until a mountain became this island. Animals from far and wide were forced to come here to escape the floodwaters. In those early days, there were too many animals living in too small a place. The island did not have enough food to feed them all. But between fighting and disease and famine, a balance was finally reached, and we have kept the balance ever since. Chit Chat's eyes grew wide with concern. If the ocean keeps rising, the island will be swallowed up by the waves, and I don't even know how to swim. If the waves ever do swallow this island, it will not happen for a very long time, said Crack. By then we will all be long dead, even me. Everyone has a purpose. It was Swooper's turn to lecture the lodgers. The sun is meant to give light. Plants are meant to grow. We owls are meant to hunt. We mice are meant to hide. We raccoons are meant to scavenge. Roz, what are you meant to do? I do not believe I have a purpose. Ha! I respectfully disagree, said Swooper. Clearly you are meant to build. I think Roz is meant to grow gardens. Roz is definitely meant to care for Brightbill. 
Perhaps I am simply meant to help others.